Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Sabrina Kilfer, and on behalf of Choice and ACRL, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Rebuilding Trust in Government and Public Institutions for a Functioning Democracy, which is sponsored by the OECD iLibrary. Uh, today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from Choice and ACRL that addresses new ideas and developments of interest to the academic library community. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. Uh, all of the attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are off, so no need to worry about generating any noise or feedback. We've got that taken care of for you. Uh, in the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Uh, we're using the Q&A feature today. Please use it to ask questions of our presenter. Uh, we'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation, so please do type your, your questions into the Q&A module as they occur to you. Also note that there is closed captioning available for today's session. To toggle the automated captions on or off, please use the CC button on the bottom right corner of your screen. Uh, also note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version. Uh, and with that, we are ready to get started. So I'll pass things over to today's moderator, Joanna Gleason. Thank you, Sabrina, and thank you to Choice and ACRL for hosting us this morning. On behalf of the OECD Washington Centre and OECD I Library team, I'd like to welcome all of our attendees today. To those who have attended OECD presentations with Choice and ACRL before, welcome back. And for those who have not joined us before, I'll take this opportunity to introduce the OECD's Washington Centre where I'm a public affairs and media officer. We are the OECD's North American office in Washington DC and serve as a resource to lawmakers, government agencies, civil society and academia, connecting them with the work of the OECD and with our expert colleagues themselves. If you were not already aware of us, you may like to save our contact details when you receive the email following today's event as we're available in the US time zone to respond to data requests, iLibrary subscription inquiries, or any questions related to the work of the OECD. I mentioned the OECD's iLibrary, which is the central knowledge base of OECD expertise, providing access to the latest OECD recommendations, analysis, and data to 2,500 subscribed institutions with over 7 million end users. And I invite you to visit the OECD iLibrary to access books, papers, and statistics related to today's topic and 17 thematic areas of the OECD's work, including governance, economics, education, tax, and more. And with that brief overview of our US team, I'm delighted to welcome Santiago Gonzalez. Santiago is an economist and policy analyst with the Governance Indicators and Performance Evaluation Division of the OECD Public Governance Directorate. He's been the lead analyst of case studies in the determinants of public trust in Korea, Finland and Norway. Santiago led the creation of question modules on the drivers of institutional trust included in the OECD guidelines on measuring trust. And he was also in charge of the creation of the OECD trust data set. So with that, thank you, Santiago, and over to you. I think you're uh, muted, Santiago. Okay, here we go. So can you hear me now? Sorry about that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so thanks a lot to ACRL and Choice for the invitation uh, to this uh, webinar. Uh, I am very pleased to be here to present the work that we at the OECD have been doing and the, that the Joanna from the Pac Washington Center already briefly introduced. 
Let me start by saying that uh, this work on public trust is, uh, is the result of a whole team in the OECD. So I am honored to, to represent uh, this team uh, today. And uh, we, we hope that this will be insightful uh, and useful for the work of these communities. So this is the outline of my presentation. I will uh, briefly walk you through the concept of trust and why is this important, why we work on this, uh, what is shown by the existing evidence that we have, and the, the surveys, the indicators that we have, what is that we have been doing at the OECD, and, and, and then some concluding remarks, and, and what is our work agenda, agenda on this topic of, of trust. So basically, when we talk about the trust, we talk about the, a person's belief that another person or institution will act consistently with his or her expectation of positive uh, behavior. And uh, here I will need to emphasize that our work focuses predominantly on trust in public institutions. Of course, we acknowledge that the interpersonal trust or trust in others is also very important and is related to institutional trust, but our true real focus is on trust in public institutions. And most notably, on the trustworthiness of public institutions. But why, why is this important? I mean, just to, to enumerate a few reasons, uh, of course, this is key to the legitimacy of public institutions. This whole notion of the social contract relies on the delegation of power by people to institutions. And this delegation is based on the notion that these institutions could be uh, trustworthy. Uh, so therefore, it is at the, at the heart, it's core to, to the functioning of our democracies and, uh, and, and our liberal societies. It is also key for people to be able to exercise their political voice, to exercise their political rights. In, associ in, association, in a society without trust, they will fear to do so. So in a way, it's also a, a key component of this two-way relationship between uh, public institutions and people. We have seen throughout the COVID pandemic also that uh, in those societies, in those, in those contexts where levels of trust were initially high, there has been more compliance with the regulation sets, with the measures that people were, have been asked to uh, basically uh, take into consideration to cope with, with the pandemic. And more generally, it's also very useful to the ability of governments to implement policies and to actually uh, move uh, ahead any reform agenda. I mean, uh, where there is trust, of course, we are not uh, asking for blind trust. Uh, we are not arguing for, for blind trust. Citizens should still remain uh, critical, but they should be able to trust their institutions and this should allow the institutions to actually uh, move forward policies in a non-conflictual uh, way. There is also a new stream of research that is showing that uh, trust or institutional trust contributes in uh, mediating the support for long-term uh, policies, policies that uh, will be key for our democracies in years to come that are already key, such as global warming or uh, debt sustainability. And uh, as was mentioned by Joanna, just to say that I come in, within the OECD from the uh, Public Governance Directorate, and as in the Public Governance Directorate, uh, consider and see trust as uh, one of the key outcomes of, uh, of uh, public administrations. So basically, if uh, public administrations are performing, if they are doing a good work, uh, this should lead to uh, people trusting them. But what is shown by the data on trust, so we have a wide array of indicators uh, on levels of trust. And here I am showing data from the Gallup World Poll that has the largest coverage and has a series uh, since 2006. And what we see is that, uh, well, there is a lot of variation. Uh, and here I show two data points. So 2007, this was before the global financial crisis and 2021. And uh, well, several conclusions we can draw from this uh, graph. Uh, on average in OECD countries, less than half of the people report to trust their government. This, this figure is actually lower for the United States where, there is, uh, where it is 40%. But what we also see is that in some countries, those uh, rather to the right, 
trust has actually decreased over this time period, while in others, it has actually increased those to the rather to the left. So in a way, we need to be mindful of the context and the specificities in each country and, and know that there are variations when it comes to trust uh, indicators. What we do know with a certain level of certainty is that uh, following the 2017, 2008, 2009 global financial crisis, there was a more or less uh, generalized decrease uh, in public trust that was actually coming back to pre-crisis levels just before the COVID. So, but of course the COVID has completely changed the situation uh, again, and I will now refer to this. So this is data that shows what has happened to trust during the, the COVID emergency, what has been the trend. And what we see here is what is documented in the, in the trust literature as the rallying around the flag effect. Is the fact that when there is a, a major shock, a major crisis, call it a terrorist attack, uh, call it a, a war, uh, call it a now pandemic, uh, people tend to gather behind their institutions. So there are usually spikes on public uh, trust. This is what we have seen for most of the countries. Most of the countries, this is uh, data uh, from basically the, the onset of the pandemic. Uh, that you see the biggest spike on uh, May uh, 2020, when we were basically, most of us were on, on a lockdown situation and very uncertain about what all of this was, uh, was bringing. Uh, it is, unfortunately, as, as we are still somehow in the middle of the pandemic, it is not, clear what will be the aftermath uh, of this uh, whole uh, situation in terms of, of uh, trust. So it's uh, still to be uh, monitored. We also note that this crisis has been of a very different nature from the one I, I talked about before the global financial crisis. So, so we don't know with certainty how, how this will affect uh, the trust uh, levels in, in years to come. It will pretty much probably also depend as well on whether the recovery strategies followed by countries. But for some countries, as, as it is the, the case of the United States, we could see that, that the, over the long run and, and with the, a lot of volatility, because this tends to be very volatile, we can see that then there it tends to be a, a somehow of a downward trend in interest levels. Uh, and this is data from the Pew Research Center in 2021 less than a quarter of the American uh, population reports to, uh, to trust that the government is doing uh, what is right. And here you see also, also very, um, I mean, uh, clearly the, the rally around the, the, the flag effect that occurred following the 9-11. So there was a spike in trust in 2001, and then uh, it, uh, it, decreased, it decreased uh, again. So, so, I mean, even, even though there is volatility, at least in some cases, we see that there are some trends that, that, that uh, could be worrisome. And uh, also, I mean, in addition to this, there is also the fact that most metrics of, of trust that, that gather a lot of attention refer to trust in the, in the government. But uh, I mean, uh, public institutions are, are much more wide and cover, uh, and, a lot of additional uh, dimensions. Here I show data uh, that is uh, based on the World Value Survey and the European Value Study uh, for OECD countries. And, and what we see is that, of course, the, the trust level varies substantially across institutions. I mean, on average, and of course, it's differed by country, but uh, you see that trust in the police tend to be the highest. Then uh, usually comes the, the civil service, then the government, and finally, uh, the parliament. So. What we see is that the institutions that tend to be of a more political nature, if we could call it this way, uh, tend to be least trusted than, than some others that could be considered more of, a, of an administrative nature. So it's also important to keep into account that there are uh, different uh, dimensions of institutions and different trust levels for uh, each of them, and potentially also different drivers for each of these uh, uh, institutions. Uh, we also know because of research we have done at the OECD 
that uh, when people answer to survey, they are able to differentiate between different institutional levels, so-called political administrative institutions, law and order institutions, even private institutions. So, so there is a actually need to, to look at all this data in a much more nuanced way and, and in a much more differentiated manner so that we could actually uh, clarify and have a, a more uh, accurate diagnosis of what that is that we are talking uh, about. So what is that we have done at the OECD? Well, our starting point was that this data was highly aggregated, that it was very hard to interpret. But although we, were, we, are, we all know and we all acknowledge that this is sending us important signals. I mean, it, it's a little bit signals of the state of mind of a society when we see distrust uh, indicators. And we started to look, to dig deeper into what was potentially driving uh, behind these numbers, what, what was behind the, the signals, the surface of these uh, numbers. And when you start looking at the literature, you find that, of course, there are several streams of research uh, trying to explain trust. Some of them argue that it's uh, very deeply culturally rooted, that it depends a lot on the context and the specific cult traits that are passed uh, from generation. Uh, other people attribute, other theories attribute the more uh, emphasis to individual uh, traits. How, however, we look at this from an angle where there is actually a, a role for uh, their performance uh, and the work of uh, public institutions in actually building, strengthening, restoring this trust level. So what, when we did all this literature research, we found that uh, there were two main concepts or drivers behind uh, trust in, in public institutions that we bundle into two broad categories that we could now uh, we have called competences and values. Competences understood as the ability of governments to deliver services to citizens at the, or to people at the level that they expect, and values or the adherence to high ethical standards and the extent to which they do it with the transparency, fairness, and uh, accountability. So we broke these five divisions further uh, down into five uh, policy actionable dimensions, what we call our policy actionable dimensions that are uh, for, in the case of competences, responsiveness and reliability. And responsiveness, it refers to uh, pretty much the services angle. So the extent to which uh, governments are actually, or institutions are actually providing services at the level that people uh, expect, whether they are doing this in an innovative way and uh, meeting what are people's demands and expectations. And within competences, we also have the reliability and the reliability, it refers to the extent to which uh, governments are minimizing risks and uncertainty. They are uh, taking a forward looking uh, perspectives and uh, in a way they are protecting people uh, from future challenges. And then in terms of values, we have uh, three uh, dimensions. The first one refers to openness and openness in terms of uh, transparency, availability of information, uh, disclosure of information, but also in terms of engagement opportunities. Engagement opportunities for people to have their voice heard, to contribute in the design, the creation of services. So basically to engage with public administration beyond just having uh, access to, to information. Then very important uh, integrity. So whether or not uh, people in office or people representing institutions adhere to high ethical standards, uh, whether they are uh, honest, whether they actually behave in, uh, in the best, in the, in the way that people would expect, considering that, that they are uh, basically uh, representing these institutions and, and paid with public money. And there is also a fairness uh, that refers to the fact that, the, well, that there is no discrimination, that there is consistent uh, treatment within the society, and that uh, basically everybody, to a certain extent, gets a fair, a fair chance and a, and, a, and a fair treatment by, by public institutions. And as I mentioned before, before, we also acknowledge in our framework that there are other determinants that are individual, that refer to group identities, social traits, preferences, 
but we also try to measure and, and interpret when we uh, analyze our trust data that I will explain later uh, what is that we have done. And um, very important because this was all uh, this framework we have uh, reviewed and updated uh, last year. And, and so we added a new element that refers to uh, the perception of government action to uh, on intergenerational uh, issues and uh, to cope with global challenges, some of which I mentioned before, such as climate change and, and uh, for instance, uh, uh, well, that's, that's sustainability and, uh, and others. As part of our framework and um, kind of linked to what I explained before, we are uh, going beyond just trusting government to include a larger set of institutions. So the local government, the civil service, the parliament, the police, political parties, uh, law and order institutions, uh, and so on and so forth. So we have tried to be much more nuanced and much more comprehensive. And based on this, uh, on this data, we have uh, basically designed a population uh, survey, a population survey that uh, goes into the drivers of trustworthy institutions. And we do that by trying a, a somehow an innovative measurement approach because we, what we are doing is that we are uh, asking respondents about what we call a quasi uh, behavioral uh, situations. It's not simply do you trust your government or, uh, or do you have confidence that your government is doing what is right. It's also putting people into very concrete situations where they are expected to interact with the administration and asking them in a kind of relation to this definition that I explained at the beginning, what is the expected behavior that they envisage from this uh, institution? So if, uh, if, uh, if there is something affecting your community, will you have the opportunity to uh, have your voice be heard? Or uh, if you apply to a government service, will you be fairly treated? It's, it's much more specific on what is expected from uh, the administration in relation to these five dimensions that we have identified as key for building uh, trustworthiness. And we have applied this survey first through uh, country case studies that we, uh, for the moment, have done in three countries, three OECD member countries, which are uh, Korea, uh, Finland, and Norway. And this is an, ex and I will show you uh, a couple of examples of, of our results based on these uh, case studies. This comes from the Finnish study that we published in May last year. And well, the first element that is important here is that, of course, uh, I talk about the differences in trust across institutions, but there are also the difference uh, across uh, geographies and across socioeconomic groups. Uh, what we saw in, fin in Finland is that, the, and this is also something that we are seeing in, in other countries we are working now, is that there are within, society, within societies also trust divides. Uh, here I show for the kind of center periphery type of relations. So the people in the Helsinki region is a vis more peripheral regions in Norway. And what we found is that the trust from people that tends to be close to the center tends to be higher. These uh, differences are statistically uh, significant. And we also find if, uh, similar results by um, uh, income and by education. These divides are worrisome because uh, if they deepen, they have the potential to fracture and to affect social cohesion. And in the long term, I mean, create different type of conflicts and, and affect, the, uh, affect the trust. So this is, uh, I mean, this we have been able to see with our survey. We have we have been able, we have also been able to look at these drivers in a comparative manner, and in a much more targeted manner. So here I, I show for the uh, three countries that for which we have done case studies, the percentage of the population that consider governments to be responsive, reliable, open, honest, and fair, based on some of the questions that we ask as part of our survey, and we see that there is important variation across uh, across countries, even within components. For instance, if you look at the first fair, fairness aspects, you see that in Finland tend to be uh, very high, not so much in, in, in Norway and Korea. Likewise, you see reliability in Finland and Norway is quite high, but uh, not so much in, in Korea. And all of this to say that in different settings, different contexts, there may be 
uh, different drivers to act uh, upon and different type of action to be implemented to uh, actually work on, on preserving or, or restoring uh, public trust. And this is what we do with our in-depth case studies to look uh, at this in, in greater uh, detail. And this is kind of the things that we are uh, able to see and to analyze with this in-depth research. So this is again, shows trust in government, local government and civil service, again, from the Finnish study. And, and what we see is that, uh, well, uh, in the case of the government, we see that the element of competence is very important, in, is the most important, it has the highest relative importance in explaining trust in government. So relative changes on this component will have the higher effect on trust in government. And most notably in this particular case, it refers to the reliability of policies. So the capacity of government to uh, kind of cope with change, uh, be predictable and be prepared to cope with, with uncertainty. The picture is different when we look at trust in the local government. Uh, we see that here the values component becomes much more important. This is again in the Finnish case. And in particularly, we, we saw here that it was very important elements of uh, openness and engagement and opportunities for people to get their voice uh, heard and to participate uh, in, uh, in policy making and in policy decision. And then when we look at trust in the civil service, again, and we see a relative importance of the competence uh, component, but in this particular case, a higher relative weight is uh, actually in what relates to, to service provision and service uh, adaptability. Uh, uh, so, so therefore, I mean, in these three dimensions, we, we have a, a different set of actions that, that we are uh, suggesting uh, for the Finnish uh, administration. So these are just quick examples of, of the kind of evidence we have uh, generated so far based, based on our survey implemented in these uh, studies. We are currently working with two additional countries in the OECD context, uh, one in the OECD context, sorry, that is New Zealand. And uh, for the first uh, time we are doing a, a, a country outside the OECD kind of, uh, let's say radio of action, which is uh, Brazil. So, uh, well, few conclusions. Uh, so as I mentioned at the beginning, when we talk about trust, we talk about the function of our democracy. So, so the kind of erosion of trust, it, it confirms when it confirms is very, a very worrisome uh, signal. And therefore it calls to, to actually undertake action, uh, action to restore it. We see that the picture is not even and is not uh, common across geographies and across uh, uh, different uh, countries. So it requires a more in-depth look into the specificities of, of each uh, context. We also saw that the existing existing measures of trust were more, more actionable. It were, they were hard to interpret. So there is need for better evidence that allow us to discriminate between the institutional and the political uh, level, but also that give us a more insight on the drivers and what is behind this trust indicator. And um, we also see from the few cases that, uh, that we have conducted that there seems to be a very strong relation between institutional performance and uh, trust, uh, trust in government, but also in other le levels of, uh, of the administration. Uh, and this is what I say when I talk about the responsiveness and the reliability as being strong predictors in the cases of uh, Norway, uh, Finland, and Korea. And again, the difference across institutions uh, that I explained when I explained the, the graph for uh, the Finnish case. So this is a very rich area of study at the moment. And we at the OECD, we also have a very rich uh, program of work on this area in the public governance directorate. We have a very strong mandate from our committee, our uh, kind of uh, overviewing committee at the OECD to work on this. So basically we are at a point where we have applied our survey in 20 OECD uh, countries. This was done uh, at the end of uh, last year to, nation, to nationally representative samples. So we will have, we will have a lot of additional data that uh, we hope to publish, to publish uh, um, later this year uh, in the second, in the I mean in the first semester of this year. It will allow us for the first time to 
have a first set of coherent measures of the not only on the levels of trust, but on the drivers of trust and start and dive much more in the different dimensions that influence trust in different contexts, and also to have a richer analysis by uh, at the country level with the, the different explanations that could lead trust in different settings. Our questionnaire, as I mentioned, it's, uh, of course it has uh, uh, questions that are about the uh, perceptions, but it also has questions that are evaluate, about evaluation and experiences with services. And, and as I mentioned, that try to go into much more into actual uh, behavior or respect the behavior, we will be able to disaggregate all of these measures by different geographies and socioeconomic groups. So we will also have a, a, a more nuanced uh, analysis on, on the different uh, on the different geographies and, and the different uh, trust uh, on different institutions, uh, but also trust by different groups in, in those institutions. And as I said, we will have also. Uh, data on the uh, long-term go governance challenges for these uh, for these 20 countries. So we hope and we are expecting that this will help us to complement and to enrich our analysis substantially. It's a big leap forward uh, for us, the implementation of the survey. The objective in the medium term is that we also generate the time series so that we are able to monitor uh, this uh, over time. Uh, also, so that we are able to see the effects of different actions put forward by, by countries in, uh, in, uh, with, the, with the intention of influencing uh, public trust. And we continue with our uh, country case studies that in a way uh, not also go much more deeper into the country setting and, and uh, are followed by policy recommendations, but also allow us in many occasions to uh, implement and test uh, additional uh, things that could enrich uh, our methodology, additional questions, or uh, look at the issue from a different angle that could also be relevant uh, for uh, other countries. So broadly speaking, this is what, what, where we are, what we have done, what we are uh, doing. Uh, it's a very, uh, it's a, an area where there is a lot of things uh, going on. It's a very vibrant academic environment and at the OECD we are doing a lot on this field. Uh, so, so you will be hearing from us in the, in the near future. Uh, let me conclude by just uh, showing a little bit uh, the resources we have available. Of course, this, this is a topic where we have been working for many years and there are many things that you can consult in terms of our measurement strategy. Last year, when uh, we revisited the framework, there was a webinar series and you could find online uh, the videos of all these webinars. The, there is a, a working paper released uh, last year where we revisited our framework and set out the new, what is the new framework. And of course, the, the country reports and information on our framework. Uh, uh, so we have uh, this website where you will find out the information. All the information it is a little bit under construction, but and also our contact email and uh, and so so. I mean, thanks a lot for your attention. I am very happy to take uh, any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Santiago, for that presentation, and thank you to everybody who has already submitted questions. The chat window for the Q and A remains open, so we continue to invite you to submit your questions. We've received a number regarding the slides and the presentation. So, for people who um, maybe joined us late, I would like to remind everybody that you will receive an email after the event with a link um, that will lead you to a copy of the recording and a copy of the presentation slides. Santiago, we have a question I would like to thank Matt. Your presentation referred to key societal trends. Matt wonders what key societal trends refers to in that data. Yes, so, so what we are referring to with the key societal trends are, let's say, common challenges we are seeing faced by a number of societies in OECD countries. For, it, for example, uh, global warming, for example, the loss of social cohesion, 
uh, for example, the increase in debt and its sustainability. So these are trends that uh, are common to several countries that are expected to have effects over time, even intergenerational effects are, are, are things that are hardly solved uh, by a single administration and in a single term, long-term policy uh, perspective. Uh, so this is a little bit what we are uh, advancing in our measurement strategy in see how we could better capture people assessment of uh, government response to uh, these long-term uh, global uh, challenges. And in many instances are challenges that could not be solved by a country alone. Uh, global warming, I mean, there are bigger and smaller players, but it requires a, a coordinated and a kind of global approach so that there is a solution. And, and uh, so it is type of things what we are uh, actually advancing in our uh, research and also exploring further the links that, uh, that it has when it refers to, to building a trust. As I said, there is uh, some research showing that support, that trust, the existence of trust, actually uh, supports for policies that tackle this type of challenges. But we hope that with, uh, with our data set and once we get all the evidence, we will also advance uh, more evidence and more research on, on what are the relationships between government action on these uh, subjects and, and trust in public institutions. Excellent. Thank you very much. And thank you, Matt, for your question. Uh, now move to Anne's question. Anne asks you to please clarify the difference between civil service and local government as referred to in your presentation. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. I mean, with the uh, so, so basically, when, when we talk about the civil service, we are talking about the people in government or um, in the administration that are not politically, uh, politically appointed, sorry, that are not politically appointed, that are uh, basically, uh, if we could say, that they will not necessarily change government when there is a they will not necessarily change position when there is a change of government. So we can talk about this uh, the bureaucracy, I can more at the bureaucracy. Uh, there are also civil servants at the local uh, level. So a lot of people who serve this provision in the front line, uh, in some contexts, in many contexts, uh, for instance, uh, teachers or police officers that are in the, in the local context are civil servants. What we mean uh, when we talk about the, the local government is uh, not so much the government in your capital, so kind of the, the center of government, if we could call it this way, or the prime minister, prime minister of, or president and his cabinet, but more the people working at the local uh, level, in the, in the county uh, uh, that is closer to, to, to citizens, so it's the, and that they, in many, in many contexts, they are responsible for a service provision. So in a way, when we talk about local government, we talk about this level, and when we talk about the civil servant, we talk more about the, the people in charge of providing services, uh, and that uh, are, uh, let's say, a, a more stable part of the administration, if we could uh, say it this way. I don't know if that was clear, but this is the distinction that we, that we make and, and what we mean when we talk about these two. Thank you, Santiago. And another question fairly specifically on the data before I move to some on your presentation more broadly. Teresa asks how generational age played into the data and how age was considered. So, uh, so we have uh, age uh, as one of the of the kind of uh, socioeconomic characteristics that we are looking to into our uh, survey. In the cases of uh, Finland and Norway, we have found that there, tend, there could be some uh, differences in trust by age levels, particularly in what relates to uh, some uh, institutions. But uh, we didn't find that these differences were consistent across all the institutions. 
So this is one of the questions that we expect to dig deeper with our largest data set that we are, uh, we are uh, expecting to, to receive or to start working with very shortly, because it's true that we constantly, and we, we hear from many countries that there is a, there, there is a perception that there is a, a, a disengagement feeling by the young generations. So that there could also be a trust divide by uh, age. Uh, in the cases we have, we didn't find it being so strong. But as I say, this co these cases are very specific and, and, and for very specific context. So we hope to be able to test this further with uh, our data set that we, with the, the data for the 20 countries that we are expecting. Thank you. Thank you for that additional information on the definitions and the nature of the data. Um, a slightly broader question, Latif asks whether you believe open government data can enhance trust? The short answer, uh, yes. So one of the dimensions of our framework is uh, openness. So as I said, the uh, openness, of course, it's associated uh, both with the uh, kind of availability of information. And uh, when I talk about availability of information, of course, data is a key asset that now is being produced by, by government, by public um, administrations. And I think that in the case of data, and we also have some complementary information on these at the OECD, uh, because we have an index on open government data uh, that is published in government at a glance. There is not only the fact that the data is open, but that is useful to people so that they, they are actually able to, to manage it and to get access to it. And that is in a format that is friendly and that they, and that they could actually put their hands uh, on. And also that the, there is some guidance, but there could be some guidance by, by the administration on how to, to use this data. So there is definitely one of the key assets that administration have uh, at the moment, their the data, with a great potential for value creation, for value creation also by people. And therefore, if it is an asset that is correctly managed and that is uh, put to disposition in the right manner, it will definitely could contribute in, contribute in building trust uh, between people and, and the administration. So, so yes, yes, the, the answer is yes, and, and a little bit of an explanation on how. <laughs> Excellent, thank you, and thank you for the extra detail. Um, another question on how programs are implemented. Um, trust in institutions to the extent that it is driven by considerations like reliability and responsiveness has critically important implications for how programs are implemented. And this question asks you to please discuss your research implications from this perspective. I mean, uh, what, what I can say about this is that uh, yes, so definitely in a way, there is a very uh, strong component on the implementation of uh, policies. Just to give you, for example, the, the case of uh, Norway, one of the things we, we were discussing with them and that uh, is one of the important findings of this research is that uh, it's very important to consider the experience for, at the front line of uh, service provision because uh, there is there where the, the interaction between people and institutions takes place, but also where a lot of the potential innovation uh, is developed. Uh, and sometimes uh, because of the ways administration uh, works, uh, with the, where there are many barriers or there could be barriers, it is not possible to scale up uh, all of this or to scale up and to use all this uh, knowledge. So in a way, uh, let's say there, there could be a lot of insights from the implementation of policies that, are, that could be essential for trust building. And, uh, and then there is a, a lot of richness of, uh, of information that could be gathered from people that is at the front line of service uh, provision. 
So, uh, so this is, and, and, and this, uh, I would say much more in the responsiveness field because this is where we actually are talking about the, the service provision. The reliability is more about the, um, let's say, uh, it's more about the, the policy setting and the protection by, uh, from governments uh, to people. So on this one, it may be, it may be harder to, to involve and to have this, uh, this, this dialogue with people, but, but, uh, but the responsiveness, responsiveness, certainly there is a big potential and the, the implementation uh, of policies of changes, uh, not only should be an objective of, 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 of trust building, but could also feed back into uh, the whole strategy for preserving trust. Thank you, Santiago, and to the um, participants who continue to send through their questions, thank you. Um, a question from Kenneth is about um, participation. And he asks whether you have data on how to involve more people in the institutions that serve them, and whether it's fair to assume that more people being involved leads to greater trust. Uh, so, so, I mean, in our survey, we are asked uh, some of these questions about possibilities to, to be involved. And uh, if people consider that their voice is uh, being heard or that they, they actually participate, that uh, this voice will be, their voice will be heard. Uh, there is also a stream of work in the public governance directorate that deals with uh, deliberative democracy. And uh, let's say people involvement in, uh, in different type of decisions in a very direct uh, manner. Uh, so, so this is also a resource that we could make available because they have a data set of cases where they discuss uh, many examples of, of this type of deliberative involvement. What I would say is that it's not only the, I think that the number, I mean, yes, there should be opportunities for, for being involved. Uh, not so much the number, but to me, what is very important is that people receive feedback on their involvement, that the decisions that are taken are explained then to them, so that, that they feel that, that their uh, involvement, their engagement was meaningful. What is uh, a very bad, uh, let's say, outcome or a very bad scenario is when uh, people participate, but the government then do not take it this into account. So more than the number, I would say that is the quality of the engagement, the feedback provided, and the fact that it's considered into the actual policy design uh, or the actual decision that is taken, what is important. Uh, I mean, it's not always possible to keep everyone happy and people have different interests, but at least uh, you have much more chance of uh, building trust if you at least explain the reasons that led to a certain uh, decision and the process that was followed to uh, reach such a decision and how you treated the input that you received from people who were involved. So these are steps that are important for, for trust building. Thank you very much. And an interesting one for us to all consider as participants in our own um, societies. I'd like to thank Jennifer for her question. She asks whether any governments or institutions have been able to make this trust information, I believe as presented in your presentation, actionable. And is there an example of where this information has guided the government or institution toward positive change? I, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I want my, what, what comes to mind is the following. I mean, um, we have seen from the uh, case studies we have conducted uh, in Norway and in Finland uh, that uh, communication is also important for trust uh, building. And we have seen a lot of this during the pandemic. Uh, these countries have had uh, a very uh, open communication strategy based on facts, uh, have been able to acknowledge when they don't know, 
um, there is uncertainty. They 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 haven't hidden. They haven't uh, hide information from uh, from people, and this has uh, proven uh, successful in their strategy to cope with the with the COVID. Um, we also constantly heard, and, and uh, there is also a, a stream of work in, in the OECD working on, on uh, the public governance on, on government communication. But we are constantly uh, confronted with uh, this fact, basically, or that this uh, notion that that uh, misinformation and disinformation uh, could lead to uh, to distrust. Or to, and that this is something that, of course, with, with social media and the availability of channels, uh, it's it's uh, it's very hard for people to disentangle what is uh, what is correct, uh, what is right, or and uh, what is wrong. So there is definitely a link of uh, of communication and how to treat uh, this uh, this uh, type of of uh, let's say. Uh, fake news or, or disinformation uh, and the effects that it could have on trust. There are ways that governments could uh, could work around this through their uh, official communication channels by making them more effective, by uh, making them uh, more transparent, by issuing guidelines on uh, how uh, governments should uh, communicate and what public servants should and should not be doing to avoid that the spread of this uh, misinformation and disinformation. But it's definitely a critical challenge because, uh, because it's a very complex landscape where, where many actors could act in, in many unpredictable ways. So, but one of the big questions, and we also heard in our, in our case studies that there was, a, for instance, an increase in the, in the hate speech uh, towards uh, public agents and public officials that uh, uh, was also causing them to uh, be more fearful and more uh, kind of uh, uh, less willing to, to actually take action or, or, or implement certain types of policies. So it, it has many implications on, 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 uh, on, uh, on several directions. So, so it's, a, it's a very complex uh, issue. Thank you very much. Um, I now have a longish question and I regret I have to ask for a brief answer to a long <laughs> question, but um, it relates to the OECD drivers of trust framework, which emphasise perceptions of intent, value, intent, values, responsiveness and behaviour. But this question asks, what about the quality of life conditions that government actions, programs, products, and services might affect. So, so I mean, in a way, I think this is very much uh, linked to to our framework, because uh, in a way, what we are saying is that there is a direct link uh, of trust or trustworthiness of uh, public institutions with the quality of uh, services and the quality of, uh, of policies. Uh, so, so in a way we, we recognize uh, this and, and we try to measure this, of course, with the limitations that a, a single uh, module or a single questionnaire uh, allows. This is, so, so we, in terms of services and the quality of services, I think it is there. It is also true that, uh, that uh, there is literature showing that uh, economic conditions and economic insecurity would also have an effect uh, on trust, basically. That, uh, uh, of course, when the economy is looking uh, more gloomy or, or, where, or when people, uh, personal situation is uh, is not uh, very positive and uh, in terms of their economic security, this could affect their trust in, in public institutions. There, there, are, there is some research showing that this is, uh, is also the case. 
we have also included a question on economic insecurity in our, in our questionnaire that we hope will also give us uh, some lights uh, about these results, will allow us to substantiate and to further um, elaborate on these, um, on these results. Uh, uh, however, as I showed at the beginning, because you know there was this this uh, this series of of trust uh, in the US that uh, is also could be associated with the economic cycle and and, uh, and improve or, or, or decrease in, in some of the living conditions at certain points. But what you also see is that there is a, a, a trend that is somehow downwards uh, over the long run, even with these cycles. So so even though these these uh, economic factors are important, we also know that they are not the only ones and that it could be even less important than those that are related to, to actually the, the performance and the, the work of, uh, of public institutions. But yes, they, they definitely play a role. Thank you so much. And given our time is running out, we'll finish on um, what I think is a bonus question from the questioner. I wonder if you can tell us in just a couple of sentences what libraries and librarians can do to help rebuild trust in government and institutions? Oh, that's a very... Uh, it's a specific question uh, for our specific audience, but I thought you might have yeah. one thought to leave us on. I mean, I, I think that, uh, that the, the, the key role is, is uh, guiding people towards uh, uh, Trust sources, uh, kind of uh, scientific resources. Uh, uh, of course, people is free to consult whatever they want, but but uh, sometimes they ask and, and, and they have questions, and the more you can uh, guide them to to information that is fact based, that is uh, that comes from a reliable source, that uh, is substantiated. That, uh, that allow them to think critically and, uh, and that they have contributed in, in building this criti critical citizenry, if I could say this way, because as I say, it's not about blind trust. I, I mean, in Western uh, democracies, it's not about building blind trust. It's about creating critical citizens that uh, will trust institutions when they are trustworthy, when they deserve to be trustworthy. And uh, this for this, and we also have seen that there is a, what a relation between a, what we call, a, we could say, civic education and trust. So the more there is a, people, a, the more people is, is engaged, willing to be a good citizens, to comply with the, to, with the, with norms, to to be involved in current events in a critical way. Uh, and this is somewhere where I think librarians could somehow help guiding people in this direction. So, so this would be my answer to, to this, uh, which is the first time I get this question. So I hope it was. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you very much for that um, answer for our audience of, um, of many librarians here with us today. So with that, on behalf of the OECD and the OECD I Library, I would like to thank you so much, Santiago, for your presentation and to the participants for their questions. I will hand back to you, Sabrina. Great, thanks. So, uh, this is Sabrina from Choice and ACRL. Um, like Joanna said, uh, thanks so much to Santiago for taking the time to present for us today and Joanna for moderating. And thanks to our attendees for your questions and comments. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about the OECD our library and how it will benefit your research team, please reach out to Ian Williamson. Uh, I'll drop his email in the chat. Uh, Ian Williamson, Ian Williamson at OECD.org. Uh, Ian's contact information will also be uh, provided in the follow up email. Uh, I'd like to remind our viewers that we did record today's program, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from Choice and ACRL with a link to the recording. Uh, also, if you have a few minutes after the presentation to fill out a brief survey, uh, we'd really appreciate it. Your responses help us improve our presentations. So thanks again to all of you out there for joining us. Uh, we hope you learned something from the session, and we hope to see you again in the near future on another webinar. <laughs>